morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences of the ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another exciting session of educational lectures for you. The first speaker of today is no stranger to us and is one of the earliest stalwarts of micro neurosurgery who taught us the ways to navigate to the interiors of the brain once considered unreachable. He is none other than Professor Vinkovi Doleng from Slovenia. Professor Doleng is a past officer of neurosurgery at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. His clinical practice focuses mainly on skull base and cerebrovascular surgery. He was the pioneers of the philosophy of clipping aneurysms in the acute phase. He has published several books and articles in various international peer reviewed journals, and he's also an invited faculty for conferences and workshops conducted all around the world. He founded the International Neurosurgery and Neuro Research Institute after retiring from Ljubljana University. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars, and he will be talking about importance of intra and extradural microanatomy in skull base surgery. The second speaker of today is our honored guest from the USA, Dr. Mohsin Nuri. Dr. Nuri is the director of the cerebrovascular and interventional surgery at the Jamaica Hospital Medical Center, New York. Dr. Nuri, who originally hails from Tehran, was a research fellow at the Fujita University in Japan. He also completed his fellowships on the Wynn Cornell University as well as the Mount Sinai Hospital. His clinical practice is focused primarily in the field of cerebrovascular and skull base surgery. He is an noted author with several publications in various internationally peer reviewed journals, and he is also the executive editor of the Asian Journal of Neurosurgery. We are extremely honored to have him today with us, and today he'll be talking about bypass for acute stroke. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our distinguished guest from Romania, Professor Chief in Florian. Professor Florian is the head of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Cluj Napoca Emergency Hospital, Cluj Napoca, Romania. He was the past president as well as the vice president of the Romanian Society of Neurosurgery on more than one occasion. He was also the second vice president at large of the WFNS. He is an ardent researcher who has published several scientific manuscripts in and is also the author and co-author of several book chapters. We are so thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair this session of Professor Dolang. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest and senior faculty from Japan, Professor Rokuya Tanikawa. Professor Tanikawa is the executive vice president and director of Department of Neurosurgery, Stroke Center, Sapporo Teishinkai Hospital, Sapporo, Japan. He is a very important member of the Japanese Neurosurgery Association. He is also a noted scholar with several publications in various peer reviewed journals. He is one of the most sought after person for the demonstration of bypass in various workshops conducted all around the world and hence also rightly nicknamed as the super bypass. We are extremely thankful to him for agreeing to chair the session of Dr. Nuri and lending his relentless support for the educational activities of the ACNS for more than one occasion. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome all the chair speakers and all the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today, and with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to our first chair, Professor Stephen Florian. Thank you very much, uh, Raja, for uh, this introduction. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank for uh, to ACNS for inviting me to be a chairman of these uh, educational activities. I participate as a um, lecturer. I, I, I was involved from the very beginning of these webinars, and I'm very, very honored to be part of this project. Thank you. Uh, for involving me, and uh, especially for for inviting me to be chairman and to introduce one of the greatest neurosurgeons we have now and we ever met, a neurosurgeon who rediscovered the importance of anatomy, who teach us how to manage and how to dissect cavernous sinus. I'm uh, very pleased because to see him here because when I started neurosurgery, I tried and I learned from his books. And uh, at that time, I tried to understand what is the meaning of cavernous sinus, of anatomy, of extra and intradural dissection, then uh, learning step by step and following his uh, advices, I really understand the importance of knowledge of this region. Um, certainly, I had the occasion to meet him in person in many occasions, and we had long discussions. 
and I'm very pleased to see him unchanged uh, in the same, yes, in the same shape. And uh, I would like to invite him to share with us some of his um, huge experience of um, anatomy, extra intradural anatomy, and the importance of knowledge of anatomy in uh, neurosurgery. Please, Professor Dolenz, you have the microphone. Thank you very much, Stefan. That was a uh, uh, very nice introduction, which I don't deserve so much, but okay, it's nice to, to be with you. And uh, what I would like today uh, uh, to show some uh, importance of uh, knowing intra and extra dural microanatomy studies, uh, which are really mandatory for skull based surgery. I will uh, focus very much on the uh, anterior clinic process and through this then to the lateral side. Uh, Yeah. No, no, no. How and why microsurgery of extradural structures became inevitable? Why? Because one of the problems in neurosurgery is how to gain space where we can work safely where we can protect the structure. And this is a surgery of the skull base dural borders, which uh, do not mean only one step uh, more anteriorly, laterally, or posteriorly, but to go extra durally from intradural space. This is entering an, the new territories. Young people have to memorize this. This is not just one step more. No, this is new, new territory. And as you see here on the drawing, on the, that we are dealing with the anterior clinic process, optic canal here, where is optic nerve, and then carotid below, posterior clinic process, then cavernous sinus, and apex of the petrous bone. So we have to know the anatomy. We have to learn by ourselves, working on cadavers, what is the uh, paracellar ICA course how the cranial nerves are positioned, located, who know where they are. And like you see from a, an interpreter, from a uh, illustration, that the carotid artery through its core, through the, through the skull base has three segments. Intrapetrus is the first segment, posterior loop is here. Then at the lateral ring, it starts intradural or paracellar or intracavernous sinus segment, then under the anterior clinoid and then intradurally. Note that intradural and the horizontal portion of the carotid in the cavernous sinus are practically horizontal and very close together. You are not aware of this when you are only intradurally. But if you know that just behind the curtain here, 
is the intracavernous uh, part of artery. You can see here from the top, you can see the, the anterior canoid, optic nerve, carotid, the medial loop, which is close to the posterior canoid, and then it goes horizontally parallel to the intradural. And here are the other, the other loops. On the right side, when you follow the carotid, when it comes into the skull base, you will see that the carotid is headed from the posterior lower corner to the anterior medial upper corner of the paracellar space. And you will see that it is looping and also spinning. Actually, the blood inside it is spinning. What is very, very important for the cooling of the blood. Now, when we are dealing with optic canal meningiomas, we are faced with different structures extra durally around the anterior canoid process. And this is optic nerve medial. Cranial nerves three, four, and V1 laterally to the, to the anterior planet process. ICA in the other aspect of it, and then bony sinus anteriorly. So you are not allowed to go uh, uh, through the dura, through the covering of the anterior clanoid laterally, medially, down, or anteriorly, without being very, very precise and cautious. That's why it is of paramount importance to master the techniques, master the drilling, master the irrigation with which you cool down the the area and you will not damage the optic nerve with heat. You need staged suction and you need to do only a bit, only a few revolutions of the uh, drill and then you have to stop and control the situation. Do not hurry. If you follow these suggestions, you will never fall into the optic nerve. You will never fall into the carotid. You will never fall into the third or fourth or V1. As you can see here, here was the anterior clanoid process. V, it was removed. And you see, on the mid, we are on the left side. On the, on the medial aspect of the anterior planet is carotid canal, is a optic canal, mucous membrane anteriorly, anterior loop of the carotid down in under aspect, and then the dural ring and proximal ring are joining to the uh, edge of the tentorium. Now, how to uh, go through this procedure safely. You have to be training before. Everybody is uh, uh, saying, oh, we have a high speed drill. Fine, we need them for the removal of the bone. But we have to be very careful with the drilling of the bone over the optic nerve. So. No drilling, no perpendicular drilling, drilling, but brushing, brushing. Go with the drill left and right. Just brush, brush, and then stop, cool, revise, and then continue. So 
you have to prepare yourself for this technique before any action. You have to say to yourself, I will drill few revolutions, then I will stop. Then it will never come the moment when you will say, oh, it's too far. Because you cannot stop at that moment. You are still drilling, even if you see that you are too far. So you have to stop before. You have to anticipate. And that's, uh, it speaks per se that you cannot be rough with the uh, removal of the anterior canoid closer, paint it extradural or intradural. Uh, this is the case where we have a humor on both sides of the of the in the canals, and this is on the left side. This lady lost the vision on the left side, uh, up down to 20%. And then we found this tumor around the optic nerve. This is extradural optic nerve, intradural. And here the wall of the optic canal is removed already. So now we are following the optic nerve here, you see. The surface of the optic nerve is normal, but here it is already uh, rough, not blistering. And you see here the, the segment where the nerve was compressed by the tumor, and here when the tumor was completely removed and anterior uh, uh, clanoid was removed before and ICA exposed at the point of the uh, uh, ophthalmic, at the anterior loop, and the optic nerve is free. This is the final situation. Note the surface of the optic nerve in the orbit, in the intradural space, and this is the segment in the optic canal which was compressed, and the surface of the optic nerve is not normal, is not shining. So we, we were lucky and the vision was preserved. And uh, the patient was uh, suggested to have an operation on the other side, because the other side, the right eye was functioning normally, but she could not accept it. So it happened later on. I was abroad, she phoned me and she said, please come doctor and operate me on the other side. I said, I cannot, I'm abroad. <laughs> and can you imagine, she became blind on that eye. Now she is living on the uh, previously deceased eye and saved by the, by the operation. Here I, we have a, a case, uh, a lady, 34 years old, she lost, she became blind on the right eye when she was 17. Now she was losing her left eye function. What to do? That's the rather small humor, but the only option was surgery for me because you can not deal with certainty, with gamma knife or other kind of, of uh, irradiation. So he suggested to her to, to operate We don't need to go through the hole. I will just go down to the where we came to the side in the optic canal when we remove the bone and we remove also the tumor now from the, uh, around the optic nerve. Even further, you can see, 
Okay. You see the vascularization of the optic nerve, which should be preserved. You have to be very gentle around uh, around the optic nerve, and not to push too much on the uh, on the optic nerve, and of course not to coagulate on the trunk of the optic nerve. Optic nerve is dependent on the rest of vascularization. And when you remove all the tumor around and uh, from underneath, from uh, the optic canal, of course, if you did not work too roughly, then the function of the Deceased nerve is remained. And so was in this in this case. Of course, later on we removed also the the tumor from the other side. And uh, the, the patient is living now on this left uh, 20% or 25% of vision on the deceased only nerve. The nature is very great and does uh, protect the patient from neurosurgeons. <laughs> but when the patient with a function is at the border of compensation, of the border of reserve, then we have to be very, very careful. And as I said, anterior clinic process represent the limitation. Sorry. Again, here is the place where was the anterior clinic. Optic nerve medial, third nerve laterally, the fourth nerve laterally. And here is the, the wall, the dural ring and proximal ring. And you see underneath the intradural carotid, the loop, anterior loop of the carotid, and intracavernous carotid, ophthalmic carotid. When we are dealing with the aneurysm at this point, we need this space. We need to work on both sides of the dura. Anabrism exposure at this point uh, need sufficient space proximal at the distal uh, and proximal part of the aneurysm. No need to expose the entire aneurysm. Extirpation of the aneurysm neck is not necessary, but dangerous. Once again, anterior clanoid is out. Dural ring is here, proximal ring is there. Cavernous anus is not open yet. And we have this region uh, exposed. Then we can deal with an aneurysm like this. Of course, we use usually the cut of the dura along the Sivian fissure. So this is a very small opening. Why we do this? Not to compress the brain. We just need to come to the, to the orifice, to the neck of the aneurysm. But we don't push the brain, which is over the, the aneurysm. We have exposed the anterior side extradurally. Optic nerve is here. 
When I was resident, they said, you have to cut the optic nerve to come to this aneurysm. No, no, you have to preserve the optic nerve. You can deal very nicely around the, the aneurysm. You visualize the carotid and where the, the aneurysm is coming out, but it is somehow hidden by the neural border. So we have to cut the neural to visualize better the optic nerve and the anterior loop of the carotid. We go down, we go down to the over the optic slot. And we will fix the dura here, you see, and we pull the dura up. And also the envelope of the optic nerve. Then we go anteriorly. You see, we are proceeding anteriorly. We visualize the aneurysm at the neck. We don't expose the whole aneurysm because it's pretty large. Now we go along the anterior loop. There is still some bone at the optic stroke, at the lateral side and underneath the optic nerve. Then we can cut further. And now we are on the border of the anode of the artery, anterior loop. Here is the neck. We have uh, the aneurysm. We have uh, the artery. And then we can hold the aneurysm at its neck. And we can visualize the optic nerve. Look here. We can put the clip because we now see the proximal side of the artery, the distal side, and we can put a clip while we are holding the artery, the aneurysm. And we do not damage, we do release the optic nerve, which is stretched over the aneurysm. The optic nerve is there. Now we don't pull the aneurysm out. We just cut it. We empty it and we leave the sac and the dome of the aneurysm. It's not necessary to, to remove each piece of the uh, sac. Then we revise and that's it. The optic nerve is free, and that's uh, finished. But we capitalize on the intra extra dural approach. And it is a kind of self control. If you preserve all the veins crossing the tibian fissure, you were gentle enough. This is the post operative. You see the clip here, and no aneurysm. And you see now the anterior. Uh, Cerebral artery. Here you see better the clip, and you see the, the ophthalmic artery, which is also preserved. Then you have a similar aneurysms you can do with the clipping, and you can deal with a huge aneurysm as this one with diameter of 5.5 uh, centimeters, but only thanks to the space in front of it. That is proximal. So here you come 
to the proximal side and then you come to the to the uh, peripheral side. Very important that you have a situation like this when there is no uh, anterior ACA1 artery. Anterior genetic process varieties. The connections of the tip of the uh, ACP might be free or might be even fixed to the floor. Then you have a canal. It might be hypertrophied, as in many uh, many jumas. It can be eroded. It can be pneumatized. You have to study this before. Like here, hypertrophy of the anterior channel process on the other side you see normal and then after removal you have you may have a eroded anterior channel process you see on this side it is normal there is missing this is a, a trigeminal neurinoma tumor because the trigeminal they they can compress the uh, against the anterior channel then the anterior channel process might be pneumatized. In this situation, you are not allowed to remove the whole uh, clinoid away. You have just to go around and to take out the outer part of the bone and to preserve the inner pneumatized side and then also to remove the tumor. Anterior can process resection, extradural or intradural. Neurosurgeons are still fighting. I don't know why. Uh, because when we, when we explore this uh, part of the uh, anatomy, we go uh, toward the anterior clinoid very very slowly, very carefully, and we remove it. Uh, and then we expose the anterior loop of the ICA, which is here. Look, we are extradurally. Optic nerve is visualized. Proximal ring is here. Adjacent to the proximal ring is the third nerve, is the fourth nerve, is V1. We see also the Paracellar space lateral wall, the cavernous sinus lateral wall. Cellular and paracellar compartment. When we study this region and we go down and we have injected specimens, we will see that proximal ring and uh, distal, uh, dural and proximal ring are coming together and they go toward the posterior channel. So, the communication between the left and the right side exists through the some windows. So through these windows, the tumor can go from the stella, can go from the cavernous sinus. You have to be aware of this. Uh, so if you have a small tumor here and here no fenestra, then the hormones will go to the to the other side and uh, Sampling might be misleading. Internal carotid artery forcing through the skull base and control of the blood flow is possible when we understand where the carotid enters the skull base canal and where it comes out. So it is forcing spinning, looping, and spinning. So we have uh, here on the left side, ICA intradurally. Pro dural ring is here. Proximal ring is here. And they come joined together to the posterior uh, uh, process. And laterally to that are the structures in the cavernous spine the third, the fourth, the sixth, sympathetic uh, nerves and carotid. If you go deeper, 
And if you study the branches of the carotid inside, you will see that inferolateral trunk is always running over the sixth nerve. So when you find the inferolateral trunk, you will find the sixth nerve underneath. But the sixth nerve might be composed of several funiculi, and you should not mix the sixth nerve branches or fasciculi with the sympathetic nerve uh, 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 running, uh, running from the off, uh, from the carotid artery to the sixth nerve. This is what we found at the anatomy of a cadaver uh, bulging from the carotid. And then it came in our mind that when the aneurysm is growing, it will start pushing and stretching the sympathetic nerves. And that uh, also stretches the sixth nerve. And this might be with aneurysm, this might be with tumor. Knowing this, I was faced with a, with a patient who had a squint at three years. Then they did successful physiotherapy. No, no, the anatomy did itself that the squint uh, disappeared. At 16, she had again the squint because the tumor grew. And then there was no more uh, possibility to uh, sleep around or uh, the tumor and the sixth nerve was compressed. Of course, father has his opinion, mother another opinion, teenage girl the third opinion. Finally, we succeeded. We showed the tumor which did stretch the sympathetic nerves, the sixth nerve and so on. And then we removed it uh, and uh, later on treated it also with the proton beam. Anterior planet process resection, respect the varieties of the AC and adjacent conflicting pathology, vascular or tumorous. Here we have a tumorous necessity of resection of the posterior planet process in surgery of posterior planet process and upper clavar meningiomas. You see the Posterior planet meningioma and after resection. That's the upper clival and posterior planet complete resection. And again, master the removal of the anterior planet process and then go to the posterior. And then go posteriorly to the Gasserium ganglion, posterior to the V3 Gasserium ganglion. Expose the ICA in the at the posterior loop, and then you have uh, uh, the possibility to remove the tumor like this. You see the tumor in the cavernous sinus, outside of it in the middle fossa, but no, the carotid artery is diseased. The adventitia is impregnated with the meningioma. And it is very important not to lose the carotid when you have no ACA1. Then you can deal with uh, aneurysms. They tried to exclude this aneurysm in several centers. Finally, we were able to do it. Then you have aneurysm. They might be in the cavernous sinus and also intradurally. And you have to resect the aneurysm. You have to use the part of the wall of the aneurysm. But this is possible only when you have a proximal control, distal control, and then you can work. Like this, you see, the artery, and this is after surgery. Which communicate, uh, ophthalmic artery is preserved, artery is uh, reconstructed. When this is 
completely uh, interrupted like this, you have to find the distal stump and make the connection. Also in, in injuries, you have to go in. You cannot just pull the nail out. You have to go in and you have to reconstruct the carotid. Tentorial edge and transition of CN3 and 4 from intradural to extradural space. You have to pay attention. You have to master the anatomy, where the neural structures are, how is positioned the third nerve, how the, the fourth nerve, how the V1, V2, the serial ganglion, and how the drainage is going out. Apex the petrous bone and the inner auditory canal with the uh, cranial nerves seven and eight. Resection to apex for the pyramid and safe corridor from the middle to the posterior cranial fossa is very important. Here we are behind the casterium ganglion uh, and here uh, ICA posterior loop and we go into the bone. We go further, we come through the apex of the uh, petrous bone. We are at the border of inner auditory canal. We cut the dura, and then we see the seven and eight nerve. This approach was actually initiated by, by uh, Dr. Shiobara from Tokyo, together with uh, Kawase and also before him. And this is how we approach to the ICK in the posterior loop. Greater petrosa nerve is here. The drainage from the cavernous sinus here. Apex of the petrous bone here. And here we can go through. We go behind the fifth nerve. We go in front of the inner auditory canal. And then we go this way and we will not damage any structure because we know anteriorly and upwards is the, is the root of the fifth nerve, posteriorly are seven and eight, and anteriorly down is the sixth nerve. Petroclaval and Dorelos canal space meningioma. Like this, you can come here and then you can remove this. And you see the tumor is completely removed by coming posterior to the Assyrian ganglion. And then it is not finished yet. You have to shift the fifth nerve posteriorly. And then you have a, 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 a access to the part of the tumor, which is anterior. You come down to the brain stem, you follow the sixth nerve, through the uh, canal or space of the sick nerve into the cavernous sinus. And then you can eradicate the tumor completely. Basilar artery aneurysm, difficult, dangerous aneurysm surgery, one way road only. So I think this is the most delicate and most dangerous nerve surgery and don't jump to it uh, without mastering and uh, having experience with other uh, surgeries at this uh, skull base. But to the anterior planoid, posterior planoid, you come to the posterior fossa. You join actually several methods from uh, Drake, Yashar Gil, uh, 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 and other uh, uh, authors, and you see, pay attention to the perforators. If you push the carotid laterally, you stretch the perforators. If you push the carotid medially, you relax the, carotid, uh, the perforators, and the space which is here will be enlarged after removal of the ACP. And this is the specimen. Intracavernous carotid, parallel to the intradural, 
rim, uh, visualizing the, uh, the pituitary gland, posterior clanoid. So you are coming from extradural to intradural, and then you go from intradural to extradural again in the cella, and then you remove the, and the posterior clanoid, and you have the nice approach to the tip of the basal artery. But for that, try to, to train yourself to stitch some, to put some stitches on a small artery at the bottom of a vessel. When you will be able to stitch and to suture an artery at the bottom, then you are qualified for this kind of surgery. And then you will be able to preserve the perforators because remember, remember, they are unforgivable. Once you put the clip on these small arteries, you have a disaster. The patient will not do well. In the history, Hugh Sampson in 78, he wrote at his report on, on the posterior fossa uh, uh, aneurysms, that they were aware of possibility of removal of the posterior planoid, but they thought it is too dangerous. Leonard Mellis made a similar uh, quotations. And Gazi Yashagi, who wrote a foreword in my book, uh, 89, very positive. I thought he does uh, agree with everything. But then later on, uh, years later, when uh, he were confronted with a basilar tip aneurysm, he said, no, 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 it is not operable. Uh, only a fool can operate this. And I was staying behind him. And he said, he is that fool. I said, no, professor, why don't do it together? And then I said, I will, I will do the approach. I will remove both clanoids, and then you will do the job. He said, OK. And then he did, of course, this with his uh, uh, gentle hands very nicely. And when he fixed the aneurysm at the basilar tip, he turned back and he said, you know, now I believe you before I did in conclusion, surgery in the lab prior to any central skull based life surgery is a must. This is my belief. And uh, then you will not be surprised, you will not be uh, conquered. And uh, 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 this book of 89 is not the final. The final is this from eight from 2003, which I work on together with Larry Rogers uh, a whole year. Chinese, they realize that this is very readable and useful. And then also the last one uh, was also translated to the uh, Chinese. Nothing is complete. Nothing is that. Everything is changing, and every surgery is not an exception. It will change. The procedures will be refined. Thank God. I like it. And this is for you, for you, for young generation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dolenz, for this uh, outstanding lesson of microanatomy and uh, exemplified with, with uh, some extraordinary cases. Uh, what can I say? Um, I have not some, some questions, but you already Asked were during your presentation to my to my uh, to my questions. There are 
uh, a lot of debate related to the surgery of skull base. Nowadays, uh, more and more gamma, li gamma knife surgery and um, endovascular treatment are capturing from our territory. So related to this, I would like to ask you, what is your advice for the next generation regarding the paraclinoidal anabris? Clip or flow diverter? That's a very good question. Thank you very much. You know, uh, first of all, we have to approach to these problems individually. And uh, we have to work with a team where we have a good endovascular surgeon, where we have a good microvascular surgeon, where we have a good uh, diagnostic people who are able to, uh, uh, to point the critical uh, points around the aneurysm. I don't like to be dogmatic and to say, oh, all this aneurysm should be clipped. No, if a patient is 90 years old, uh, anesthesia is more dangerous for the patient than the aneurysm. So maybe the uh, 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 endovascular treatment is the choice. Uh, however, not all the cases are so clear that we can use uh, endovascular or for other, but we have to work together. We have to discuss openly, very uh, with, the, with, the, with the facts, what is possible from surgical point, what is more dangerous from the surgical point. Uh, but all in all, I think surgery is not and should not be eliminated from this discussion and treatment. There is our place uh, and we are uh, uh, responsible for each individual case to say, look, these are our experiences we can do this so and so. But if the other conditions of the patient do not allow a longer surgical procedure, of course, then we will say, okay, it is for endovascular. But not eliminate us, or better to say, we should not emulate, uh, 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 we should not eliminate ourselves as. It is the practice in so many countries. I can, I can uh, uh, tell you, I was persona non grata in France because they had and they still have a very good endovascular people. And the surgeons, they say, okay, then you do this. No, this is not honest. We have to be honest to the patient uh, to the point that it hurts. We have to uh, discuss all the details, all the parameters of each patient individually. And we have to uh, reach the consent from endovascular uh, uh, point, from neurological point, from neurosurgical point, that this modality for this patient, for this aneurysm, is the best choice. Then we will support us also if Murphy will take place. Yes, uh, you have right. Yes, thank you. Uh, another question is related to the tuberculum cell meningioma. There is another discussion among surgeons. The American school, uh, it's in favor of 
always drilling and opening of the optic canal, drilling and of the tuberculum and opening in every single case in order to prevent recurrence. Others are in favor of opening of the optic canal only in cases in there there is an in tumor uh, along with the optic nerve. What is your uh, practice experience related to this? That's uh, that's a very 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 important question. Namely, this. Uh, tricky pathology of meningiomas. Uh, you think, oh, the, first of all, this is a benign disease. No, it's not a benign disease. You just have to follow it for long enough and then you will see it comes back. So, of course, uh, following this, uh, uh, you will say, let's remove the last piece of the tumor. Let's uh, go after it also in the canal. But I was trying to publish something about the meningiomas, but I never had answers to the questions because I did not have a, a sufficient group of this uh, pathology. And I found, uh, I found out that uh, they are coming with clusters and they have a different behavior. You may have a carpet-like meningioma over tuberculum cella. It's very thin and it goes into the optic canals. You may have a, a bulging, a very bulky uh, meningioma over tuberculum cella. It does not go to the, uh, to the, uh, to the canal. So, I don't think that in every case it is necessary to open the optic canal, but you have to revise to check the entry into the optic canal uh, below the uh, ligament, uh, ligamentum falciform ligament. You have to open the central portion of the optic canal, of the optic canal. If you see the, the nerve is clean, has a nice shining surface. You don't need to go through and through because the, 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 the canal is making a small angle in the, its uh, midpoint. So uh, according to my practice, the, the nerves, the, uh, the meningiomas, they are going into the canal are not all, no, only a small portion of them. This is also my impression. So I don't have maybe uh, your experience, but uh, I only remove and I open the, when I see clearly that there is going the tumor along with the nerve. So, yeah. yes. Uh, are there any other questions from the, we from the other short comment from Professor Tanikawa as well. He is also a legend in Parklanad and Eurisons. Professor Tanikawa, any comments from your side? Order. Uh, thank you, Raja. Thank you very much, Professor Binko Dorenz. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Really, really impressive, and uh, the you you uh, presented the very important principles, so many principles. And uh, uh, I, I learned a lot from you about the scalpel surgery. Uh, I have been learning uh, for this more than 30 years. Uh, the book I, I, I bought first time was yours about cavernous science. Uh, that, that, that book was very impressive for me. And that is, that is an opportunity, that is a chance. Uh, I entered the uh, uh, skull based neurosurgery. So thank you very much. And uh, I, I have a one question. Uh, in, my, in my experience of a paracrine aneurysm with the anterior clinoidectomy, uh, I have around uh, uh, six to 7% of blindness after surgery. 
uh, even of course the of course the optic nerve is uh, perfectly preserved and the aneurysm completely clipped but uh, the six to seven percent patient have their blindness and after surgery and it, it, uh, uh, interestingly the all the patient uh, appears uh, blindness uh, uh, 36 to 48 hours after surgery. So this is the uh, delayed something deterioration due to ischemia, due to uh, uh, venous congestion, something. And uh, the, the, still, I haven't, I haven't uh, have a solution of, of this complication. So if you have any uh, suggestion from your enormous experiences, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I will go straight forward. In my experience of over 3,000 uh, opening of the, of the optic canal and the removal of the anterior clannery process, I have uh, four cases of the blindness. Two cases, I know what was. First, my assistant, uh, jump into the nerve and damage it uh, mechanically. Okay. The second one was similar, but then the two cases, uh, the blindness uh, started or occurred uh, next day. For this, I have no clear answer, but I did not have a time to go. Uh, into the details and into the uh, uh, variations of the uh, vascularization of the optic nerve. So it's for sure of thymic artery, okay? Sometimes if we see the branches from the thymic artery to the optic uh, trunk already intradurally and then in the, in the canal. But there is also the, some, Times some uh, patients have a very small ophthalmic artery or no ophthalmic artery at all, but the, it comes directly from the cavernous sinus. So my my uh, uh, my uh, suspicion is that in those two cases, the it came later on the vascularization of the optic nerve was dependent at least in part from the vascularization of the cavernous sinus into the uh, orbital part of the uh, optic nerve. Uh, so um, uh, for that reason, my policy is to preserve the ophthalmic artery for every case for all the cases. And for that reason, it is so important also to uh, uh, be gentle and also not to drill too long, not to exert the heat damage of the nerve. If you do some, only few revolutions uh, and then you stop and then you cool, uh, you will not have it. That's uh, another uh, uh, suggestion, maybe, or my observation. But tell me to uh, let me uh, allow me to tell something. I'm so happy and so much admiring your work because you are too young and you were not at the <laughs> meeting in Toronto when the bypass surgery was completely abolished. And I was against, I was fighting with these people. I said, no, this is not correct. We have to know, we have to put the clear indication because we need revascularization uh, processes. And you know how long it took to, uh, that uh, those, uh, wise man realized that and that not uh, always uh, is possible to survive without a revascularization process. So your job 
is fantastic, is very, very important, and will be more and more important in the future because the population is aging and more vascular problems. So more revascularization problems. And that's why your kind of surgery has a future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your suggestion. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I think if there is one question we can take from the uh, chat box, which is, when would you advise extradural or intradural drilling of the anticlinal process? <sighs> I am favorite for extradural because uh, the dura is the natural protection of the structures. And uh, of course, uh, you have to be very gentle, to be very careful and so on, not to make a wrong step. But you may, you have to consider the possibility that it may happen, that you make a little, a little uh, too clumsy uh, movement and you may be in the, in the nerve when you are intradurally, or you may enter the aneurysm when you are uh, intradurally. But if you're extradurally, these possibilities uh, is less. So I'm uh, uh, for extradural removal. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Because of the lack of time, we cannot take further questions. We can go to Professor Florian to hear his concluding remarks. So what to conclude uh, in such an extraordinary presentation and uh, having Professor Dolins along with us, uh, really one of the greatest surgeons, neurosurgeons uh, nowadays. And uh, I'm, I, for me, it was a great honor and pleasure to have him, to see him and to learn even at my age, <laughs> thank you very much thank right. you very much you. thank you thank you, you very much it was indeed a wonderful session and what a great inspiration you have been for all the young neurosurgeons thank you very much for all the teachings so we'll move on I, to the I second session and i would invite professor rupia tanikawa to say a short introduction and invite person marcin nuri for his lecture okay uh, can you hear me okay uh the, today uh uh, as a second second lecture, uh, we can have the uh, 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 about the uh, uh, acute acute revascularization by Professor Mosenori. Uh, it's my pleasure to chair uh, Professor Nori's lecture, and uh, uh, the, as well, I have been uh, working uh, for cerebral vascular. Uh, revascularization uh, very concentr concentr concentratory. So uh, uh, I'm very looking forward to see your work today. Uh, and uh, uh, many of the neurosurgeons, especially uh, young neurosurgeons, are uh, as well looking for your lecture because uh, uh, after the the after the failure of the uh, 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 chron chronic revascularization study, um, the chronic revascularization is difficult to, to perform in nowadays. So the, the nowadays uh, it's a, uh, it's a good opportunity to, to, to try to do a acute recanalization, especially uh, using uh, endovascular tools. But uh, even, uh, even the, in spite of uh, such a uh, good developing of the endovascular devices, uh, after trying of uh, endovascular uh, recanalization, still uh, the sum of patient requires uh, acute revascularization like uh, 
uh, HDMC BIP or something. So the the sun the the acute recanalization, acute revascularization is a, a very important option uh, in acute stroke. So the, I'm I'm very looking forward to your work. Thank you very much. Please start to your lecture, Professor Mozen. Um, thank you so much, Professor Tanakawa, for your um, kind introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everybody across the globe. Um, I'm sure that everybody enjoyed Professor Dolan's um, beautiful and insightful um, uh, lecture as much as I did. And it's a great pleasure and honor to be here among you people. Um, as uh, Professor Tanakawa very well mentioned, um, performing um, cerebral vascularization and bypass these days af after having the results of cancer study is declining, unfortunately, across the globe, especially here in the US, at least. In Japan, we had JETA study, had positive results, and I'm, I learned from my Japanese mentors when I was there, and I could see that uh, Japanese colleagues are still performing a uh, good amount of like uh, 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 several vascularizations in, uh, cro for chronic uh, occlusions, but unfortunately, it's declining here in the US. There are some national uh, uh, data showing that uh, there is a downtrending after publication of cancer study in 2011. So uh, performing that in acute stage could be uh, even a little bit more challenging here, especially after development of recent trials and studies showing effectiveness of uh, endovascular treatments. So. Um, Without wasting time, uh, I prefer to jump into the presentation and um, let me know if you could see my slides here. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna briefly introduce myself and my center, which is kind of related to the topic. And then uh, we'll go ahead with the presentation. Um, I am part of the Department of Neurosurgery at Jamaica Hospital Medical Center, together with two of my colleagues, Dr. Chilwal, Dr. Chakraborty, who's covering mainly spine tumor and the trauma services. I'm uh, directing cerebral vascular endovascular services here in this hospital. We started our practice almost one and a half years ago uh, in July 2020. Um, I do almost 25 nights uh, coverage a month for both cerebrovascular and endovascular cases. So majority of cases, procedures performed here are done by me. Um, we do around 250 annual cerebral vascular procedures, including <laughs> AVMs, AVs, plus aneurysms, acrotids, uh, stenting, endotrectomies, thrombectomies, ICH evacuations, all both open and uh, endovascular techniques. Um, my practice is mainly located in Queens, in New York City. New York City has five boroughs. The largest one and the second most popular one is Queens. And this blue circle here uh, spots our hospital. Uh, I had the pleasure of performing and honor of performing many of uh, uh, procedures for the first time in entire Queens, including doing the first cerebral bypasses here. Um, performing first TCOT uh, together with my uh, vascular surgeon colleague, Dr. Khalil, and also performing first endoscopic ICH evacuations here in Queens. Um, our center and practice uh, gained the highest um, recognition by American Heart Association last year for uh, the quality of care we provided to our stroke patients. Um, These are all showing that our practice, though it's young, it's growing fast, and also we are very quality oriented. Over uh, the last one and a half years, um, I performed about around 15 bypasses, uh, including 13 STMCA, one STAPCA, and one ECA vertebral artery. Um, they were mainly for stroke cases. One was for an aneurysm and one for Moya Moya. Uh, 
11 of these cases were transferred to Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan, where I also practiced there as well, together with my mentor and uh, colleague, Professor David Langer. And uh, four of these cases, including one double barrel STMC bypass we perform here uh, in our hospital, Jamaica. In the first 10 months of 2021 up to, up to the end of October, we had over 700 stroke codes leading to 85 emergent endovascular procedures with these patients uh, with a um, uh, mortality rate of about 7% and recolonization rate of over 93%. Um, only about like 6% um, of our cases will remain, uh, we, we had persistent occlusion after endovascular treatment. Um, this shows that uh, our practice, though I also do a lot open vascular cases in a wise manner, are also, I mean, it's, the practice is mainly endovascular oriented. Uh, and we are pretty aggressive in uh, our recanalizations and our outcome speaks for itself. So uh, what would happen to these patients who remained persistently occluded after having acute stroke with large vessel occlusion? Okay, let's go over two of these cases that we recent, recently had in our hospital. So, um, a 73-year-old man uh, was found down on the floor, brought to the hospital, initially awake, following command, but confused, clearly, and without any focal neurological deficit. About four, five hours later, he deteriorated, and while he was being woke up for medical issues, at this time, after deterioration, a stroke code was announced. Initial CAT scan that was done before this deterioration was normal. So he gradually became more confused, unresponsive, not following, and just localizing. Uh, after cholesterol was activated, brain scan repeated, brain CD angiogram and CD perfusion are also requested. And at that time, after performing CAT scan, NIHS has dropped to 22 and patient was intubated. CT angiogram that was performed showed that there is complete blockage of the right vertebral artery in the neck with some retrograde filling uh, upper in the V3 segment and a uh, very small left vertebral artery that was ending up in left pica without a contribution to the basal system. The basal artery itself was uh, filling retrogradely through bilateral pecans. CT perfusion shows some hyperperfused area in bilateral PCA territories. We took the patient uh, for an intervention and he was clearly demonstrating signs of basal artery hyperperfusion. So uh, on the le uh, left hand side, you could see the origin of the left vertebral artery is this bump that is uh, completely occluded without any distal runoff. This is the subclavian run showing ascending cervical artery contributing anterogradely to the um, vertebral artery between C1, uh, C1 and C2. And on the right-hand side, you could see the left vertebral artery that ends up in pica. So multiple attempts were made with even like very stiff catheters such as uh, quick cross, which is a catheter usually used by peripheral intervention, is not neuro intervention, is to pass this, uh, this occlusion, but they were all unsuccessful. At the end, I did a right ICR angiography, which shows retrograde filling of the basal system through the PCOM, and also a left uh, IC injection, which shows also a partial contribution to the basal artery to the left peak on the road to a lesser extent compared with the right side. So uh, we uh, like um, attempted for around one and a half hours to pass the occlusion without any success. At this time, around like 2 a.m., um, we have kept the patient flat. We hydrated the patient pretty well and had um, permissive hypertension. We obtained a brain MRI right after the procedure, which showed only this tiny stroke. The brain stem was intact. At this point, the treatment options in front of us was just conservative treatment, proceeding with anticoagulants and blood pressure optimization. 
versus having surgical options uh, on the menu. Um, surgical options could be vertebral artery implantation to common carotid procedure that is well described, extracranial to PCA bypass to improve the blood flow in the basal system, and finally, distal ECA to vertebral artery bypass. So uh, we lightened the sedation. We could see that patient was still symptomatic uh, without like uh, globally aphasic, not following commands, not opening eyes, and uh, just posturing in all four extremities. We decided to go ahead with the final uh, option, the last option as distal ECA to VA bypass. Uh, patient was transferred to Lenox Hill Hospital. Another MRI was performed right before the procedure to make sure that the stroke is not pro progressing and we still have salvageable brain. MRI repeat MRI showed that the stroke was stable. MR Nova showed that there is only 11 milliliter retrograde filling of the basilar artery, which is definitely not enough. The system was hyperperfused and lack of any uh, uh, anterograde flow in the right vertebral artery. As I'm not focusing on technical uh, nuances, I'm, I'm just going briefly over the video. You could see that we were like in the right uh, uh, in, sorry, incision in the neck. Uh, we were trying to uh, find out the, the vertebral artery between C1 and C2. Um, a cephalic vein graft was prepared by our vascular surgery colleagues. Um, and end-to-end -end anastomosis was done to the V3 segment of the vertebral artery. And um, then an end-to-side anastomosis was performed uh, approximately to the ECA. And this is the final view of the, of the graph. This is an intraop angiogram that shows patency of the bypass and graft. And this is a post-op day one angiogram that shows again our graft um, to the basal system. And this is the lateral view. Post-op MRI shows just very, very small strokes in the posterior circulation that were not like significant. And MRNOVA showed significant improvement of the flow in the, in the basal system with having like uh, around 70 cc's in the basal artery. The post-op uh, uh, post day two patient started following commands again and extubated on day five and discharged to rehab on day 11 after passing swallowing tests successfully. And the second case I want to present is a 60-year-old female with past medical history of diabetes and hypertension who came with altered mental status and started hemiplasia for an NHS of 29. She was intubated in the ED uh, to protect the airway, uh, presented around like 10.30 a.m. And the last normal was 11 p.m. the night before. An short CAT scan. And the ED showed some uh, established acute to subacute uh, infarction in the left basal ganglia. And CD angiogram showed a complete occlusion of the left IC terminus with a tandem lesion and complete blockage of the IC in the neck. There was significant hyperperfusion on the left uh, hemisphere and CD perfusion. Patient was taken for intervention. You could see complete blockage with a very trace amount of flow in the region, uh, in the proximal ICA uh, here. Um, again, I tried multiple catheters to pass through this occlusion of wires. None of the neural uh, wires could, could work. I tried stiff peripheral uh, catheters such as quick cross, trailblazer, they still weren't able to pass it. Uh, to get a better access, I inflated a high pressure balloon in the ECA to reformat the origin of the ICA to have a better cushion for my micro catheters and to stabilize them there. Uh, you could see uh, the balloon inflated here in the ECA and this is a micro catheter trailblazer trying to pass through the ECA, it didn't work. I 
even toward the back tip of the wires, which is very, very stiff. It was very dangerous to do that. I tried that. The plaque was heavily calcified. It didn't let me in. I still didn't give up. I did a right ICA angiogram, and I could see that there is a decent sized anterior communicating artery. This is a sub, uh, mental vertex view, which means that the, the, the uh, view is very, very caudal. The catheter, you could see it here, it's sitting in the proximal A1 segment of the uh, anterior cerebral artery, uh, filling both sides. Using this roadmap, you could see here, I mean, I know that the quality of image is not very good. This is the roadmap of the same view. Uh, the aspiration catheter is in the contralateral ICA here over the wire. I did two passes transcirculation, but unfortunately the catheter size was small. So uh, the uh, recanalization was not successful. Uh, I attempted for over, over two hours and, and a post-op MRI showed the, the uh, limited strokes compared with baseline CAT scan was almost the same stable. It's still not uh, full MCA syndrome, gauge deviation, globally aphasic, completely plagic on the right side. The light in the patient exam was still the same without any improvement in spite of medical management, hydrochem patient, permissive hypertension, keeping a flat, none of them worked. Same scenario. At this time, treatment options were conservative treatment versus surgical options such as bypass or surgical thrombectomy of the IC terminus clot with and without endotrectomy of the neck lesion. MRNOVA again showed almost absence of blood flow in the left MCA and a good decent size. We need another MRI right before the surgery. It doesn't have any technical uh, novelties here. This is a post op uh, CAT scan which shows that the, the stroke is stable. Post op angiogram day one shows um, the, the, the STAMC bypass here, this patency. Uh, post op course uh, day two, patient was extubated, following commands, received PEG, gastrostomy in day nine, and transferred to subacute we have on day 11. While he was opening eyes spontaneously, this artery uh, and uh, alert oriented times two to name and place and have some withdrawal on the right side to noxious stimuli. So the NOxious improved uh, from 29 pre up to 16. So uh, what's, what's, uh, what's the message from these two cases? It seems that uh, as we discussed before starting the presentation, several bypass could be used both as a secondary prevention in chronic phase or in acute phase. Secondary prevention was, is usually uh, recommended for patients with cerebral vascular, uh, impaired cerebral vascular reserve. This was the topic of previous trials, ECIC in 1980s and CASA study. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about today, that's totally different category. Um, I'm gonna focus mainly on emergent bypass for acute, so, uh, Revascularizations for uh, acute treatment categorized into emergency uh, IV, IA thrombolytics, and vascular recanalization. They're very well discussed in the literature. And the last two options would be surgical thrombectomy and surgical bypass. These two last, uh, the latter two options are less discussed, and we have like uh, scarce information and data on them. Um, emergent bypass and cerebral revascularization could be done in three different settings. One as a primary optical bypass. Second scenario could be when EBT or endovascular treatment would fail. Like uh, we offer endovascular treatment. If it fails, then we go with uh, surgical bypass. These are the two cases uh, that I just introduced. And the third one is that when we are observing a patient uh, with a large vessel occlusion, then the patient clinically deteriorates. And then at that point, we offer 
surgical revascularization. I'm gonna go over all these three options one by one briefly. So as a primary option, we usually do, uh, may do that when EBT is contraindicated, like for example, se severe contrast allergy, or when uh, we have difficult access, for example, femoral radial carotid, for any reason we may not uh, have them available, or we may think that from images, CT angiogram or MR angiogram that we've done, we may think that uh, due to anatomical challenges, EBT most likely would fail. And finally, it might be just surgeon's preference and that center's experience that uh, they have a better outcome with surgical uh, options rather than endovascular. Second scenario that we discuss is when the EBT fails. Uh, based on recent trials, between 10 to 20% of endovascular uh, treatments may fail. Uh, our current series, the failure rate was about 6%. It could be biased because it was retrograde and it was like a score by I myself, not the third party. But still, we could say that around 10 to 20% of such cases may fail uh, successful recon endovascular recognition. And that could be potential cases for surgical bypass. I would discuss later why I say potential because not all of these cases would be surgical uh, candidates. And finally, the third scenario um, could be a patient with mild or moderate stroke uh, that is initially uh, managed conservatively with medical management and all of a sudden patient deteriorates, develops new symptoms, and then they take patient for uh, acute and emergent surgical vascularization. The incidence of such deterioration is usually between 10 to 15%. There is a recent uh, study, a retrograde um, uh, study from France uh, named minor stroke showed that the rate is around 12% for early deterioration of such patients. This deterioration could happen any time between day zero, like uh, the, the same day of presentation to like one week. Majority of cases happen this time window. Uh, for these patients, again, we may have endovascular versus surgical options. So um, this figure shows neuronal function after large vessel occlusion versus cerebral blood flow. In this zone one, um, usually the function of the, of the nerves is normal, then the uh, uh, function might be impaired, and finally the cell may die. Uh, this is something very well described and just trying to summarize everything in one figure. Um, so these, these are two shadow or like borderline zones here, zone 1x and 2x. I named them just to, to be easier to, to refer to them. Um, so uh, here we may have like a completely normal CT perfusion or any perfusion study that we do and uh, in spite of having a large vessel occlusion. Little by little, we would see like perfusion deficit on imaging, though the function is still normal, then the function would be abnormal. Then the patient, I mean, those cells would be, uh, the, the, um, the uh, uh, survival of those cells would be jeopardized and finally they may die. Um, these, uh, uh, one thing that we should know that after a large vessel occlusion, for example, an M1 occlusion, different parts of the brain could be in different zones. For example, MC territory, some part could be in zone three that already dead on MRI, for example. Some part could be on zone two, like malfunction. And some part could be in zone one, completely normal without any hyperperfusion deficit. So it doesn't mean that the whole brain would be in one zone. It could be like different part of the brain being different zones. So, Zone three is easy to uh, 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 recognize on DWI uh, studies. Uh, they would restrict that. And zone one, again, you could have like usually uh, uh, normal or abnormal perfusion with normal function. These are the cases with large vessel occlusion that we are usually making them candidate uh, uh, with a spec or PET, uh, PET scan studies for a possible bypass in subacute or chronic phase like the topic of the study by CASA study and ECIC bypass trial. Um, 
Okay. Um, so we are talking here mainly about people located in zone, zone two and two X, uh, because these are patients who usually with impaired function after large vessel occlusion. And if we do not recanalize them, they are they at a high risk for rapid deterioration and reaching zone three and having uh, the infarction completed. Okay, so let's go back to the three main scenarios that are um, uh, uh, a topic for urgent surgical vascularization. Um, I want to say that, I mean, this presentation, I'm mainly focusing on the main two uh, options, primary option or fail endovascular, because they're technically different uh, from the third scenario that is clinical deterioration. I would say why, because when you have a large vessel occlusion that is managed initially with med medical management, these are usually patients in zone one and one X. So they're candidate to be evaluated for cerebrovascular reactivity. And they, are, they were usually more or less similar to the CASA study patients. We're not sure about if bypass would benefit them or not. So the scenario would be different. Predictive risk, uh, the predictive factors could be different. Decision-making uh, process could be different and prognosis could be different. So in this uh, presentation, again, I try to mainly focus on these two uh, scenarios. They're more or less the same. Why do I say they're the same? Because even the first option is a kind of fail endovascular treatment, but the failure happens in the mind of interventionist or cerebral vascular surgeon before even trying. Like we said that when you choose a surgical bypass as the first option for a patient, most likely it's a case that you think that EVT would fail. So you don't even try it and you go directly with bypass. So I wanna, uh, consider these two categories as one and uh, focus mainly on them. So when EVT fails, what could we do? Uh, first, we could improve our endovascular techniques. This is something that is done daily, monthly, and yearly. You could see a lot of uh, new innovations coming to the market. The second one is having surgical options as plan B. Um, for endovascular improvement, they are mainly in three different categories, main categories. Uh, either we are improving our navigation and access. Sometimes we can't even get to the lesion with our catheters because of the, the tortuosity of the vessels, like we have a bad aortic arch, we cannot navigate to the lesion. Second, we get to the lesion, but we cannot cross it, like uh, the two cases that I had here. The, the plaque is so heavily calcified that we cannot even pass it, either intracranially or extracranially. And the third scenario is that we can pass it, but we cannot open it. Either the aspiration doesn't work on a clot, or it's like, again, heavily calcified. We have no option to open it. You try the standard retrievers or aspiration that don't work. So new innovations in endovascular fluid are focusing on these three Category. Many of them are still not approved in the US. They're all in use by our colleagues in Europe. Um, so our focus here is again, surgical revascularization. We have good evidence that uh, surgical revascularization between 62 and 24 hours after, from the last normal uh, known well is effective. A result of a recent uh, um, um, systematic review and meta-analysis study called Aurora that was published just a few days ago in Lancet Journal, again, approved it um, after reviewing multiple uh, randomized trials published recently. So we know that opening these vessels in this time window could be effective for anterior circulation strokes. So now our job as supervascular surgeon is to understand the safety and feasibility of emergent bypasses. If we open these vessels with surgical bypasses, is our morbidity and safety good enough to be included in these, uh, uh, in these pa patient population who would benefit from revascularization or not? And then we should compare this outcome versus those who are left unrevascularized. Like if, if EVT fails and if we do not 
candidate those patients for surgical bypass, what would be the outcome? I want to briefly review the literature. This is a, a very nice study, a, a systematic review up to uh, June 2020 from Switzerland, uh, Dr. Wegley, Dr. Spazito. Um, the 19 studies were included in this study. They're all for anterior circulation except for one, and they're all low flow bypasses. Indications for acute bypass is very interesting here because majority of these studies included patients based on progression of symptoms, which we discussed it should be a, a different category rather than failure of uh, EVT. Failure of EVT was the second most common indication and then a presence of penumbra. Penumbra was uh, evaluated mainly in recent studies. Like when you go to studies from like 10, 15 years ago, it was of lesser importance. Um, Limitations of this study, uh, this uh, systematic review, you know, most of these studies were published before 2015 trials. So uh, even some of these studies were published after that, data collection and surgeries were performed before 2015. So we do not know how aggressive the interventionists or surgeons were in uh, uh, interventions and EBT option also uh, we do not know how uh, effective those tools were. We know that the initial the, like uh, instruments that interventions had, the recognition rate was very low compared with uh, recent tools and armamentarium that we have nowadays. Um, many of these studies contraindication of failure of EVT are not explained clearly. I, I, I read all, almost all these studies one by one. Most of them do not tell you why EVT failed or uh, what were the contraindications. They just tell you that, okay, EVT was contraindicated in these patients. If this was just imagination of a surgeon, I mean, it's difficult to buy that these days, especially, because um, we rarely encounter a patient that just based on CT angiogram or MR angiogram, we say that, okay, EVT would fail. Um, there are many other like limitations for these studies, of course, uh, like some of them were not mentioning NHSS or radiological inclusion criteria. And uh, most importantly, most of these patients, there were, the indication was failure of initial med medical management. And again, as I said, they didn't even try endovascular treatment. So they're not like, if, if you go with them, most of them are not applicable to the category of patients we are talking about today. Okay, but still we could get some good messages from this, uh, uh, these studies. It seems that based on overall pool data, um, uh, patients would still benefit um, uh, from these, uh, some, some of these patients, especially those with progressive symptoms, the relevant ischemic phenomenal mismatch, uh, they could have satisfying neurological and radiological results. It seems the majority of these cases, over 70% achieve MRS, a good functional MRS like two or below uh, in long-term uh, follow-ups. Except for one study, it seems that bypass could be done safely in acute phase, like in the first week of a stroke. Uh, one study also showed that it could be done safely and effectively after uh, giving TPA to the patients. Um, as I said, only one study was discussing in the, the, the acute bypass for posterior circulation occlusion, didn't have like promising results. Um, we should always separate circulation strokes from anterior. That is done in, in uh, endovascular literature as well. Even the basic trial that was evaluating thrombectomy for basilar artery occlusion was published in 2021 again recently. Like some uh, shortcoming and limitation of that study, I'm not going to go in details for that, but this is what I'm saying that in spite of all like positive trials for anterior circulation, we still do not have very convincing studies for posterior circulation, recanalization, even for endovascular techniques. Um, this is also of uh, uh, data from literature, like 76 patients. 
um, showing that like mild to moderate strokes and the admission, they deteriorated, the NHSs got higher, then they underwent surgical bypass and got better after the surgery. There are a couple of messages from this figure. First, again, it shows that all these patients collected from literature, um, majority of them deteriorated again before uh, uh, acute bypass. So again, it's another um, evidence that most of these patients were initially managed medically. And then when they fail, they went for bypass. And it seems that when they go for bypass at this point, though the bypass improves their clinical outcome, it doesn't make it better compared with baseline. Um, there is also some other conclusion from this. It, I mean, it might, there might be some uh, restrictions uh, uh, and some considerations when we are doing surgical bypasses because the blood flow restriction is not uh, as much as what we do with endovascular. When you do like M1 thrombectomy, the amount of blood flow that comes back is incomparable with when you do just a single STAMC bypass. So that may explain partially why this patient may not get improved completely, recover completely, or their clinical symptoms may improve gradually and slowly over time, rather than so quickly when it happens with endovascular treatments. So um, what would the perspective for um, uh, acute and emergent bypass? So as I said, we need to discuss and understand safety and efficacy of surgical bypass in the era of modern endovascular treatments when uh, our outcome is like as good as 80 to 90% and recolonization rate is high, and we could offer it to a majority of our patients. What is the safety and efficacy of that? When you go to literature, rarely you would find some like cases or um, studies that are specifically addressing this question. Um, then there are some other more important questions that will come next. Now, how much could we improve recolonization rate with adding surgical bypass to our armamentarium? Um, and how the outcome could be different based on etiology, what would be the importance of long-term graft survival? We may not need a long-term survival of the graft compared with, for example, when we do revascularization for aneurysm, because um, some of these cases may get recanalized after a couple of weeks, like those with emboli or with those with dissection, and they may not even need the bypass at that time, but so this bypass is just to help in an acute phase to prevent major stroke happening. What would be the selection criteria based on time window, based on uh, the stroke volume and uh, DWI or perfusion studies? And uh, then a major question comes up, how many centers, how many patients could have access to a surgeon 24 seven who can do an emergent STMCA or like any type of bypass in a safe and effective manner? Uh, so this is uh, uh, what uh, I discussed earlier, that why I say that those not recanalized cases are potential uh, surgical bypass candidates, not definitely candidates, because many of these patients, by the time that endovascular treatment has failed, they have developed large infarction, and definitely they're not a good candidate. Some of these patients are too old, like... Uh, around 10 to 15 percent of our cases here are over 90 year old. Um, you should always um, uh, like consider make a balance between risk and benefit of performing a surgical bypass for an like 95 year old with multiple comorbidities versus just going ahead with medical management. Also, some of these 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 cases that we call them unsuccessful recanalization may have a still like TK2A, which means that like 40, 30% of the vessels are now open and the occluded vessels could be pretty distal. And we do not know if surgical bypass could be feasible on those vessels and how effective it could be. And also there are some other questions like how much flow such brain would require. Like we have an occlusion, technically we have a patient who has a large vessel occlusion similar to a scenario that has failed a balloon test occlusion. 
So are we going just to replace and do flow augmentation or are we going, are we going really to do a flow replacement? Uh, because they have failed a balloon test occlusion. So if you are going to replace the whole MC territory, like for our case, is just a single STMC bypass enough? These are questions that needs to be addressed. And also site of bypass, should we do like a proximal MCA bypass, distal MCA, or should we go with thrombectomy versus uh, uh, surgical uh, bypass? Currently, this is the workflow that I have uh, in my hospital. Um, definitely, I'm gonna revise it more and more in the future with having more experience with such cases. When a large vessel uh, comes in, if it's low in HSS, goes through like uh, medical management and brain spec to evaluate uh, the patient for uh, impaired CVR and a possible subacute bypass. But if NHS is high, patient is functional baseline, has salvageable brain, then patient is candidate for endovascular recanalization. Uh, majority of cases, at least so far, all cases, I could say. If it fails, then I would usually do an emergent MRI with MR perfusion. And then based on that, if you still have salvageable brain, if patient is a good candidate medically for surgical bypass, we would go ahead with surgical revascularization. Um, as uh, Professor Delance and Professor Tanikawa very well mentioned, bypass was almost extinct some years ago. It, it happened a couple of times, but it came alive again. To me, more or less, it's like uh, the legendary uh, bird, Phoenix or Rognus. This bird is unique in its nature. It's just uh, one and only one. It burns itself to ashes, but it comes alive again from its ashes to live again. It's a symbol of eternity and it's immortal. It may die, but it would come back again. Bypass, I mean, as interventionist, uh, as a cerebrovascular surgeon, I think we should pay more attention and it has very good potentials, even in acute stroke, let alone in chronic uh, cases. Thank you so much for your kind attention. There were so many things that I missed them here. I mean, I couldn't discuss everything. I know that it took a long time, more than what I was supposed to, to make this presentation. I thank you everybody for your kind attention and patience. Thank you, Professor Nori. Yeah, good work, excellent. Uh, I was so impressed by your work. Uh, yeah, uh, in the first case, uh, you showed us uh, the, the wonderful bypass in between external carotid and uh, uh, vertebral artery. I would like to ask you the reci re recipient part at the vertebral artery was in between a C1, C2 vertebra or a B3 segment uh, just above the C1. Uh, uh, so, I, I, yes, yes. I actually made a mistake by mentioning that as V3. No, it was between C1 and C2. So it was the distal V2 segment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So uh, uh, the you exposed, you exposed the, the vertebral artery by uh, dissecting the uh, part of uh, part in between the C1 and the C2 vertebra. Exactly, exactly. We found yeah. it right on the top of the C2 lateral mass and then followed it more superiorly toward the C1, dissected there. If you need, you could drill the bone the, to like get uh, more redundancy of the artery. But most of the time, I mean, we have done only two cases so far. And mm -hmm. uh, um, in these two cases, we didn't need. Uh, but if you if you really need yes if you need more length of the vessel you could also drill this C2 or C1 lateral mass to release a little bit more of the vessel. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's exactly where we dissect the vessel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a good work. That's that, but uh, everybody knows that the 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 understanding the anatomy is a bit difficult. Uh, we need to go to a cadaver and. Uh, to try to dissect there uh, very meticulously. 
uh, especially uh, management of the uh, Venus system is a bit complicated. So uh, the, we need the training before to do a, a such a such a, uh, uh, challenging, challenging surgery. Anyway, uh, the bypass between the external carotid to a distal vertebral artery is very effective, especially in uh, uh, such a the bilateral vertebral artery occlusion or uh, some uh, something kind of a kind of a, uh, subclavian steel syndrome phenomenon. So uh, uh, it's it's a very good option to revascularize uh, the posterior circulation. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that was very interesting. And uh, you mentioned the after the failure of end vascular recognition in especially cardiogenic member something. Uh, we have a still chance to save the patient brain function, even after the, uh, the something minor stroke occurred in uh, the basal ganglia was uh, somewhere in the brain. But uh, if we we could if we could uh, save the patient brain by uh, uh, acute bypass, the by a uh, uh, meticulous rehabilitation, the patient may recover well. So uh, this is a this is a new chance for neurosurgeon, uh, not a, not the external decompressive surgery, but uh, uh, it but uh, the really really saving the patient brain function. It's a, it's a very important. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that, there, it, that's it, so true. I completely agree with you, especially for young patients like sixty or early seventy, where they they could they could be very very functional with minor like comorbidities. So performing this surgery and being aggressive sometimes uh, to save their function rather than just giving up and saying that okay. I mean, we tried and the last option, that's enough, um, could be, could change someone's life forever. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, the, the, you mentioned about the, uh, the, the, the one of cause of a failure of end vascular recognition is uh, uh, difficult to access because of a very, uh, the tortuous cause of uh, uh, proximal arteries, uh, including uh, uh, aorta. So uh, in my institute, I I uh, ask my young guys to check the uh, uh, aortography during a CT angel, and uh, uh, we have to check the uh, the cost of the aorta and uh, uh, all the the vessels. And um, how, how do you manage uh, to evaluate such a cause of the, the uh, arteries? You know, um, uh, in our hospital, we do CT angiogram and CT angiogram always shows us from the level of heart and above. So we always have the whole arch there. Um, my lag techs and uh, nurses, when they are opening the table and they are preparing, they never open the catheters before I review coronal sections and sagittal sections of the aortic arch and tell them probably which catheter would work here. Because mm -hmm. based on the arch, based on the difficulty of navigation of the uh, vessel, I may decide sometimes to change the catheters or to go to a different approach from radial and rarely, over the last one and a half years, I only had one case of direct carotid puncture. Uh, mm -hmm. So based on that, I, I make the decision that which approach I would I would go, either transradial, transfemoral. I'm not like, you know, you may you may have uh, seen this in, in uh, neurointerventional societies. Some people say we are radial first, meaning that they're trying to do everything through transradial approach. I'm not a fan of a big fan of that, especially because as a surgeon, I respect radial artery a lot. I try to save it for a possible bypass as always, 
and I do not want to have an eight French or nine French catheter or sheath through that. So I usually select them one, one by one based on the anatomy that I get from the CT angiogram. And based on that, I choose the catheters or the approaches. Uh, I could say that probably more than 90% of the cases I will go transfemoral without any problems. Sometimes uh, I go initially from transradial, sometimes I switch. Like I try transfemoral first and then I switch to transradial or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, you, you do everything by yourself, the endovascular recognition and the surgery. You do both or yeah. the, you do both? Yes, yes, I do both of them. Oh, both excellent. Both. Yeah, because uh, the, the, there, are the, there are some uh, difficult situation in, uh, in the hospital because uh, if the endovascular treatment is performed by a radiologist, uh, after failure of uh, recognition, the, and uh, the, the radiologist consult, consult to neurosurgeon is sometimes difficult. It's a depend on the situation in the, in the hospital. So uh, the, it's a, it's a time wasting yes, yes, it is. such a process. So the you do both is, is a very, I, very I good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I have some colleagues that I may sometimes call them who are more experienced than me working at the Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan. I get like consul, uh, consultation from neurosurgeons, from neurointerventionists, neurologists, neuroradiologists. They're always available to help and support me to get more and more experience and to be on the safe side for the patients as well. But procedural wise, I usually do uh, both sides myself. I mean, I also get, get some help in the OR from my colleague, Dr. Uh, Chilwell, who works uh, closely with me. And uh, we are like trying to expand the program, hire more people, hopefully um, uh, I, can, I can spend more time in the OR in the future. Mm -hmm. Good, very excellent. The, in Jamaica hospital, in your hospital, the mainly uh, you, neurosurgeon, uh, have the uh, initiative to manage the stroke patient, right? Yes, it's actually for all the stroke codes that are activated, like for large vessel occlusion, when NHS is six or above and the ED attending thinks that it's a possible a stroke, they call me immediately. I mean, we mm -hmm. have a workflow that they send me messages immediately. We, before even doing a CD scan, CT angiogram, or anything. So mm -hmm. many of these cases, I mean, I see many pathologies, I see many consults, it could be sometimes overwhelming for me, but at least I have like direct supervision of all these cases, I know how they are being managed. Even for those cases that are like patients seemingly asymptomatic, but has some stenosis or occlusion, they would still call me. So I could say that I get involved in almost all these cases directly. And that's why, though maybe we are like uh, working in a medium sized hospital in New York City, we're still uh, treating a considerable number of like both open and endovascular cases here. Mm, very good. Very impressive. Thank you very much. Thank you Raja? so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Dr. Mohsin Nuri. It was a wonderful presentation, and you rightly showed that hybrid is the future of neurosurgery. We can take a few questions. I would invite my course, Dr. Liu Bun Singh. Thank, thank you, Raja. Thank you, Professor Nuri, for a very nice uh, presentation. And one, just one question for you, uh, Professor, regarding the case that you show chronic occlusion of vertebral artery, uh, and, and chronic occlusion are uh, the highest risk of uh, recanalization. And, and do you use uh, MRI or, or CT cervical, especially at the foramenal level, uh, to determine whether what the risk of a vascular injury in, in recanalization? And in your opinion, as a hybrid surgeon, uh, which, uh, although you show the algorithm is always recanalization as the first choice. So, in those cases, in which cases that you may want to go for bypass first rather than uh, 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 intervention? Uh, 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 procedure, Professor. 
You know, if, if, if it's chronic occlusion without any symptoms or if the symptoms are very mild and you can like let the patient like recover with just uh, medical, like many times patient comes to the hospital with like an HSS of four or five, you see minor stroke on MRI and you see a like chronic occlusion of the ICA, for example. Uh, in those situations, usually if you do medical management, improving perfusion of the brain, those symptoms may got even better. And usually I would evaluate these patients for uh, impaired CVR later for a subacute or uh, I mean, a later time bypass. Uh, I would not go with um, uh, uh, direct recanalization, acute recanalization of these vessels, either endovascularly or surgically. But if such patient comes with like NHSS of 29, for example, the taste that we had here, then you have no choice. Uh, but to go there and open that vessel. You know, recanalization for that ICA occlusion was not just to open the vessel, was to get access to the IC terminus occlusion. You know, I probably wouldn't care about that occlusion in the neck uh, if I would open, just, just open it enough to pass my catheter through to open the IC terminus. That was all I needed at that moment, uh, which unfortunately I couldn't at that time. So yes, it's a decision that you usually make. And of course there are risks, but when NHS is high, you take the risk, you accept the risk and you go for it. And sometimes though uh, it may seem that it's a, a chronic occlusion, it's usually a plaque that has ruptured and has caused complete occlusion in the neck and has sent distal emboli and has caused some intracranial occlusion as well. So most likely this was a chronic plaque in the neck that is ruptured, sent distal emboli, occluded the IC terminus, and also occluded the whole vessel in the neck. That's usually a scenario. Thank you, Professor. Professor Kosumo Noda is here with a colleague of Professor Tanika. Professor Noda. Uh, thank you for the lecture, the Professor Nori. I have one question. The, yeah, we, we always try to do the the emergency bypass for the patient, but the problem is what is a worsening, what, what is the cause of worsening the neurological deficit? If the, there is MO occlusion, the hemodynamic problem is treated by the acute bypass. But if there is a EDSA lenticular striated artery infarction, we cannot we cannot solve the problem. So we always do the DSA or the spectrography to distinguish that. So what do you think about the, the, how, how to distinguish it? The LSA or hemodynamic infection? To distinguish if this is uh, a stroke from the LSA or this is the MCA hyperperfusion? Okay, uh, that's that's a very good question. That's a difference between a cortical infarction and, and, and a deep infarction, lacunar infarction. When you get infarction from uh, lenticular straight arteries, you may have hemiparesis on the other side, but hemiparesis is not a cortical sign. We have mm. distinct cortical signs. Aphasia is a cortical sign. This arteria is not a cortical sign. So if your patient just has this artery and has some like hemiparesis, it could be explained by the lenticular straight artery. Mm -hmm. But if your patient has gaze deviation, if it has hemineglect, or if it has aphasia, these are cortical signs. Then you know that your patient has hyperperfusion rather than a stroke from those. Symptoms are, in the, in the clinical exam is very important in here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Jayanan Sudhir is here. Dr. Sudhir, any questions from your side? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Nauri, for a beautiful presentation. Uh, I'm just happy and impressed that you are uh, taking up a lot of uh, neurosurgical interventions for stroke patients. But I always feel there is a reluctance on part of neurologists to hand over the cases, even after failed uh, endovascular treatment to neurosurgeons, because they feel they have an impression that the bypass actually takes a lot of time and that uh, passes beyond the window period that uh, is there in their mind. But I have seen uh, my mentor, Professor Tanikawa, take up such cases for acute uh, thrombectomy and uh, giving beautiful results. 
uh, I see that you have a series of 12 cases in which you have uh, taken up for uh, revascularization or bypass. Would you go in for an embolectomy in the same sitting or would you fear there will be a risk for uh, hyperperfusion in such cases? That's a very good question. Actually, I have no experience with thrombectomy. And I, I've enjoyed presentations by Dr. Tanikawa or uh, Professor Takizawa on thrombectomies for uh, acute strokes in the past. But I have no experience. Honestly, uh, it's a very good question because for example, for our patient that had IC terminus or cubectomy, you may even save the anterior choroidal artery and PCOM that are being fed through the IC terminus. When you do a bypass, at best, you're going just to recanalize the MCA territory. You're not gonna deal with the rest of those vessels. Or if you have an embolic occlusion, you do bypass, you're just gonna save cortical branches. You're not dealing with uh, lenticular steroid arteries. This is a question that we should keep in mind that if, uh, acute uh, like uh, emergent thrombectomy could do better than bypass. At the same time, there is another thing. Most of these cases who would fail thrombectomy if the interventionist could reach up there and cannot recanalize the, uh, the clot, it's most likely ICAT. It's most likely intracranial atherosclerosis disease. So thrombectomy usually doesn't work there unless you wanna do endarthrectomy, like open endarthrectomy. But again, some people I know that have experience with, I do not. Um, so it depends on the etiology. If uh, this is uh, atherosclerosis versus uh, emboli, distal emboli. Um, I don't know what is the experience of Dr. Tanikawa. I remember once I asked Dr. Takizawa, he was telling me that for atherosclerosis, he usually prefers bypass over thrombectomy. I have no experience for that maybe Professor Tanikawa could help us better with answering this question. Tanikawa, any answer? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the simply uh, the surgical embryectomy or of course uh, the end, end vascular thrombectomy. The, these uh, options are effective for a simple, simple embolism, but uh, Embolism with a chronic atherosclerotic change or thrombosis by atherosclerotic change, the, it's a it's a difficult to recognize directly by a, a thrombectomy, the, the regardless and vascular or surgical. So the, in such case, of course, the uh, acute bypass like uh, SDA MC bypass is uh, very effective. And, but uh, the problem is uh, before, before the treatment, uh, sometimes it, it's uh, difficult to distinguish whether the, the occlusion is due to uh, uh, embryos or atherosclerotic change or embryos with atherosclerotic change. So the, even, even if we, uh, we check the uh, uh, something uh, susceptible vessel sign on uh, a T2 star imaging pretty operatively, uh, sometimes it is difficult to distinguish them. So uh, the, uh, we need to rest, uh, we need to react uh, appropriately uh, during the treatment. And uh, if some, if the atherosclerosis, uh, we, we try to do a acute bypass. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to conclude this with one question to Dr. Nuri. What is the time window you recommend for anterior versus posterior revascularization in an acute stroke? It's, it's, it's more or less the same as endovascular. Right now, we are not making decision based on time. We're making decision based on image. As far as you have a live brain, go ahead and do it. Thank you, so thank you very much. When there is difference between imaging, like BWI and the symptoms, you know that there is radiological clinical dissociation, then you could go ahead and do revascularization. Thank you very much. We can conclude this session. We can hear the concluding remarks from Professor Tanikawa. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mose and Nori. The, 
uh, your presentation uh, tonight was a very uh, uh, wonderful and uh, uh, you encouraged many of the young neurosurgeons in the world. And as well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Binko Drentz, uh, the very precise anatomy. Uh, 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 we learned a lot from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. With that, I will wind this up officially. Unfortunately, Professor Tolink has left early. And uh, on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers of today, Professor Vinko Dolink and Professor Mohsin and Dr. Mohsin Nuri, and the chairs, Professor Stephen Flory and Professor Rokuya Tanikawa, for the time and support for the educational initiatives of the ACNS. A special thanks to Professor Shubin for supporting us in our educational ventures, as well as broadcasting these webinars in China. Today, there are more than 2,000 participants who had joined us live on different channels like WeChat, Zoom, and YouTube channel. A special thanks to my co-host Liu Bun Seng also for joining me today. So until we all meet on the 11th of December, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.